9th to the 13th centuries, successive god kings ordered thousands more acres of jungle to be cleared for rice production. Water had to be cleverly harnessed to irrigate the new fields. If the system failed, the very survival of the kingdom would be at stake. Well-maintained canals were also crucial to Angkor. Every day, tons of heavy stones for the construction of temples would be transported by canal from the Kulen Hills, 50 kilometers away. Planning expert Jacques Gaucher believes the success of Angkor is due to the elaborate system of interconnecting waterways. You are tanks of ponds which are dug to, to keep also this water and you have some canalization. This royal palace is full of small canalization. The city is full of channels and the outside, the territory, is also full of big channels. These systems, which are different level of scale, they must have been connected to each other. It was the Khmer's ability to harness water that made them unique. While the Dutch were experimenting with their first canals, the Khmer were already past masters. The most recent excavation by Jacques Gaucher reveals the complexity of Khmer water management within the royal city. His surveys have uncovered two huge reservoirs, each measuring 300 meters long and 20 meters wide. A major road intersected them. Water needed to flow around the city. What Gaucher wanted to know was how the road could be used while water still flowed from one reservoir to the other. So he began to dig. The excavation unearthed a stone dike where the road and reservoirs met. It also shows that the reservoirs were built on slightly different levels. Beneath the surface of the road, narrow channels in the dike allow water to filter from the upper reservoir into the lower. But the arrangement may have been too finely balanced. Playing at such a scale with the management of water, with such small differences of level, I think the system was quite fragile. And if there were any variability in the environment uh, or in, in the maintenance of the city for social problems or political ones, I think the precision, I mean the ultra sophistication uh, can, can, can have been a, a weakness in the system in, in a way. This complex system provided water throughout the royal city for drinking, cooking, and even bathing. Cambodia is an excessively hot country, and it is impossible to get through the day without bathing several times. There are no bathhouses, no basins. However, every family has a pond, or several families of one in common. Men and women go naked into this pond. The construction of extensive water systems and great stone temples in the jungle demanded colossal manpower. Why would the Khmer be prepared to devote so much of their year toiling in the king's name? Why was it that the peasantry out there in the fields contributed so much labor, um, willingly it seems, to the maintenance of the center? And the answer may well be that they really believed that the king was a god and they were working in the service of the deity and this uh, kept them going. Oh, I think without a doubt, I fully agree with you. I, with the, you couldn't have built the city of Angkor without that kind of firm belief. But although the Khmer people dedicated enormous effort into constructing their great city, it was the addition of slave labor that made it possible. Zhou describes these unfortunates. Wild men from the hills can be bought to serve as slaves. Families of wealth may own more than 100. Those of lesser means content themselves with 10 or 20. Only the very poor have none. 
we know, too, again from the inscriptions, that some of them had a very raw deal. There was one who tried to escape from the land to which he was, in which he was born and was, and, and was assigned. And they found him, and they brought him back, and they gouged his eyes out and cut off his ears. Punishment was severe for all subjects of Angkor, noted the Chinese diplomat. In very serious cases, a ditch is dug outside the city, the criminal is dropped into it, earth and stones are heaped on top until he is buried alive. Lesser crimes are dealt with by cutting off feet or hands, or by amputating the nose. The economy of Angkor was based on international trade. The Khmers produced food for their swelling population, but there was a surplus for trade with neighboring states. They wove fine cloth, cast huge bronze statues, and exported ivory, kingfisher feathers, beeswax, and scented wood. Their main trading partner was China. The reliefs of the Bayon uh, reveal a Chinese trade junk coming across the waters of the Great Lake just south of Angkor. And we know that there was indeed a great deal of trade going on because of the more recent archaeological research that has been excavating in the Royal Palace. And there they've been unearthing a considerable quantity of Chinese ceramics. Zhou Daguan's delegation were not the only Chinese in Angkor. In fact, Chinese settlers had been there for years. The Chinese always take a wife here as soon as they arrive, deriving additional benefit from the woman's business skills. In Cambodia, it is the women who take charge of trade. There are no shops in which the merchants live. Instead, they display their goods on matting spread on the ground. Women held positions of power and authority. They owned property, engaged in trade, and even served as bodyguards to the king. But the Chinese interest in Cambodian women was not driven solely by trade. Everyone with whom I talked said that the Cambodian women are highly sexed. One or two days after giving birth to a child, they are ready for intercourse. If a husband is not responsive, he will be discarded. By the end of the 13th century, Angkor was at its peak. A succession of god kings had built this beautiful and astonishing city. A sophisticated water system made the city work, fed its people, and created wealth. But then, at its very peak, cracks in the system began to appear. Cracks that would lead to the city being abandoned to the jungle.